Uh, welcome everyone on our uh, session on modularity and domain-driven design and the question if it's a killer combination for our software development. Uh, my name is Tom De Wolf. I'm a software architect at ACI IT Solutions, a mid-sized company uh, from Belgium. And my name is uh, Stan van der Ende. I'm also an architect colleague and also serve as a CTO of the same company. Part of the material that we will be presenting today is actually uh, impl is, a, is conceived as part of a platform for um, VAB fleet services. That's one of a, it's, it's a big automotive uh, service provider in Belgium. And they're building a platform to actually um, uh, retail and trade cars, um, transport cars uh, uh, on. on um, so if you uh, go back in, in, in time and, and look at our, our initial uh, motivation for uh, for us to actually come up with this modularization and, and DDD combination is it's all about customer satisfaction and of course our customer wants a high quality high value output that's fit for purpose so he wants something that's architected correctly with fit for purpose in mind but he also wants a predictable cost of change over time because what we see nowadays is that actually the rate of change is drastically increasing. And of course, it has an impact on our software system as well, because that software system probably needs to adapt in order to, um, to evolve with the uh, business uh, needs over time. And what you normally see in a typical graph uh, of a software system that lives for multiple years is that initial development is going quite smoothly. There is a lot of uh, attention on the architecture principles, and all is going quite well, and then suddenly the cost starts rising. And of course, that's not a predictable cost of change. A simple change from a business perspective will result in a high cost uh, and high impact change on uh, IT systems. And what we actually are trying to do is actually flatten this curve out. So making sure that a simple change remains a simple change uh, also over time when our software is maturing and growing, actually. Yeah, and if we look from the point of view of software design, there's actually one important principle uh, we want to aim at, and that's the classical separation of concerns. Uh, we want highly cohesive components in a system that are loosely coupled. Now, in the case we don't have that, then the cost of change can become quite big. So for example, let's say we have uh, three uh, uh, modules in, in our system, and there are two concerns depicted with the yellow and blue color uh, scattered around the system and, and uh, not, not really encapsulated. If you would do a change uh, on one of those features, the chance that it will impact all of the other modules in the system is quite big, and that's uh, quite a costly thing to do. Uh, another kind of change can be in code where the two features are quite in, inter, uh, intertangled with each other and that would even uh, require us to say, okay, maybe this module better split up into two ones. Uh, again, not really a, a predictable cost of change that is contained within your module. Um, what we like to have is, of course, that each concern is encapsulated in its own module and if we then do a change, for example, in uh, the right one, uh, then it only impacts the other one if the API would change, and if we do a change in uh, the left one, then it will only impact that module. So we actually are aiming for a one-to-one -one mapping between the business change and the software change, right? So that we can actually pinpoint a change to a single module, a single part of our software system. Uh, because in the end, our, sole, our, our, our primary source of change will be a business change, actually. Yeah, and software design says, OK, you have to encapsulate that source of change. And if we take these two uh, viewpoints onto software development, then it clearly uh, leads us to the fact that in the first place, we need a functional modularization of our system. Now the question is, how can we do that in the right way? So let's start from a simple, it's a simplification of our domain model, but it serves our presentation, of course. This is actually part of the business domain of an automotive service platform. 
So of course, everything is centered around vehicles. Vehicles have a set of options, a make, uh, a model, a warranty. And a vehicle is owned by a business partner. It's a B2B system, so it's a business partner that has an address and some contact information. And of course, this business partner or another business partner wants to actually do a transport for a vehicle from business partner with address A to business partner uh, located at address B. This is just a very simple domain model, and we are using DDD. So now the question is, how do we modularize this? Because this clearly isn't a modular domain, right? If you look at, at that uh, domain model, we can actually see that there are three different parts of it. One in, in the uh, right corner about describing which are the business partners for, uh, for the platform, their uh, uh, coordinates. Uh, another one for, that's busy with how can we describe the specifications of a vehicle that has to be transported with their model and options and, and the make. And one example of a service uh, context in which transports are, are done. Um, each of these in uh, domain-driven design would be called a, uh, a bounded context. And of course, there are still relationships between these bounded contexts. So for example, a vehicle still has an owner. And that's then mapped onto a business partner in the other uh, bounded context. And for the transport service, we still have an item to transport, which is mapped to the vehicle in the vehicle bounded context. And we still have a consumer and a supplier, which are both uh, business partners. But what's important to see here is that each bounded context has its own terminology and its own focus on part of the, the problem domain. And it's the context mapping in between that then uh, uh, gives you, you the functional links. Um, so already from the start, when we do the analysis, we try to find out which are the different bounded contexts and the different uh, business parts of the customer so that we can align our uh, software development and our modularization with that. So each of those bounded contexts would then end up into the software system as a separate module. So again, the vehicle business partner and transport module with their dependencies in between. Um, now, modularization has, has no use, use if, you don't, if you're not able to modularize all the way. And all the way means from the front end right into the database and also into the database schema. Um, so each of these, so if we focus on what the impact on the schema would be, then each of these modules will still have their own tables with the data that's specific for that uh, context or that module. But of course, there are relationships in between. Uh, for example, the item that needs to be transported, the unique reference there is in a table within the vehicle uh, bounded context. And somehow, this is a, a, a relationship between them. Now, the question is, can we, as we do within one of those modules, put a foreign key into the database table to reference that, uh, that identifier? Problem with that is, if we do that, then, for example, if a change com comes in to change, change the vehicle bounded context, and it would require a restructuring of the tables within there and move the column with the identifier to another location, then that would imply that we also need to, uh, um, to uh, re release and, and adapt the transport module because that one is dependent on the internal structure of uh, the vehicle module. And then we lose uh, some benefits from, from modularity. So no, we don't want any foreign keys or other database structures that cross those uh, bounded contexts. Same goes for uh, queries that are written. If you would have a query in transport that uses the database structures of the vehicle or the business partner domain, then having a change in the latter would also imply uh, having to change the first one. Benefits we get from modularity in this case is that each of those domain modules can be migrated independently and changed and upgraded to the next version without having to know the internals of the other one. The database schema remains internal into the domain bundle, so it's not part of the API of, of the module, which gives 
quite some flexibility to development and the structuring of your module. And one extreme of that is that we can even choose to uh, use another database technology for, for, for example, the vehicle module than we use for the transport module. Of course, this has a number of implementation challenges. Um, we we uh, split them up in, in three main blocks. Uh, first one is we have to have a way to uh, migrate our database in a modular fashion. Second one is we have use cases that cross our domain uh, bundle, so we need to have some transaction support for that too. And lastly, there are still uh, use cases that require uh, some kind of search and aggregation from data in different modules, so that's also a challenge we have to tackle. Each of the, them will be, will be discussed next, and first, of course, is the uh, modular database migration. So what is actually the migration challenge we're facing? In a typical setup, you have a number of development machines, uh, possibly an integration server, test acceptance and production, and each of those servers can contain at each moment in time another version of your database schema. In a modular situation, you add to that that within one environment, multiple modules can exist, and each of them again, can have a different version uh, and, and a different path of migration uh, within that environment. It's clear that manually tracking which scripts already have run on each environment or each module is not something that you want to do. So we need a solution that allows us or supports us to track those changes. Now, there are a number of uh, frameworks out there that allow us to support that. The one we've chosen and applied is uh, Liquibase. Um, this is just one slide to, to explain the, the basic uh, workings of Liquibase. So, in, in its essence, it's a way to describe all the change sets that need to be applied incrementally to your database schema. These change sets are described and put into your versioned source code, so with each new version we release, also the uh, database change sets are uh, delivered. Liquibase has an uh, XML-based domain-specific language to describe those change sets, giving each, each change set an ID and, and its contents. And the most important part is that it will add an extra table in your schema to track which change sets have executed successfully on a specific environment. And that way, uh, Liquibase is able to uh, decide which change sets that are deployed on your environment still need to run, and, and they can run, uh, then he can uh, execute them. Um, next step is, of course, how, of what is the impact when we have a modular system? So we take again the example we talked about earlier, the vehicle transport and business partner module, each of them having their own set of chain sets uh, embedded and encapsulated in them. If you would, for the first time, deploy such a system, then each of those modules gets an initial version deployed, and of course we need migration to the initial version of the schema too. Second deployment would be that we still have new versions of each of those modules, but for example, only have database changes in two of them, and in the other one, we don't want any migration to happen or, or be triggered. And a final deployment can also be that we only want to adapt the transport module, deploy a new version of that module, and make sure that our migration kicks in to migrate that module to the new uh, schema version. Looking at such a picture, it's clear that we need the ability to migrate these modules separately. And the deployment of one of those modules needs to trigger uh, a process of migration. Um, the way we have done that is by applying uh, a well-known pattern in the OSGI world, which is the extender pattern. And what it basically does is, if you have your application bundles, let's say those, those four, and there will be 
another bundle, the extender bundle, which is specifically targeted at uh, extending the other bundles with uh, a new feature or a new, new uh, possibility. What it will do, it will define and look for a certain extension pattern within those bundles, and if they match, it will extend those bundles that match with that uh, extra functionality. Uh, possibly using an, a framework dependency to, to be able to do that. So for Liquibase, we have built an OSGI Liquibase extender, which of course has its dependency on the Liquibase framework as we all know it. And the extension pattern will be a name of a master change log file by convention, which will then uh, point to the change sets which are encapsulated in each bundle for that specific domain. The advantage of this is that only the extender bundle is dependent on the Liquibase framework. So the domain bundles and application bundles, they only have to contain those XML-defined uh, uh, change sets and lists. And what the extender will do is it will trigger a new Liquibase process for each bundle that is deployed within the environment, which allows us to migrate each of those bundles separately. And also, the update of a single bundle in OSGI will trigger that extender again to then only and specifically migrate uh, changes that are deployed or being deployed in that bundle. So that's a way how we achieve a modular migration of our system. A second challenge has to do with use cases that, of course, cross those, those uh, domain uh, boundaries. And one important thing is to be able to support transactions that go uh, over those domain boundaries. And then the obvious question is, do we need distributed transactions or not to be able to uh, support one transaction spanning multiple uh, domains? In the case, there's, there's one obvious case where we don't need it. And that's when we don't have any specific persistence layer, it's just uh, direct SQL execution and we have one data source. Then there, there's not really a problem. But that's not the typical case. Of course, the, the typical case where we do need uh, ETA is when we have multiple data sources, uh, even of uh, different types uh, that support uh, transactions. But the less obvious case is that when we have a persistence layer in each domain bundle instead of one big persistence uh, unit and we still only use one data source, then we've seen that the only way to get it really working across the domain bundles is to still use a distributed transaction. So how would, would that work? Let's take the transport and, and vehicle module again. And if we have a use case that comes into the transport module but also requires a change in the vehicle domain, then it would impact the persistence context embedded in each of those domains. So we don't want to put the persistence context outside uh, our modules because then again the internals of your model would leak out and not be so well encapsulated into our uh, modules. Those persistence contexts of course need a data source for that. So another module is specifically uh, responsible to uh, create and expose a service, a data source service, which is in this case XI enabled. And for that, it needs a transaction manager for which uh, there exist, for, for example, Atomicos bundles that will provide you with that transaction manager as a service, again, uh, to be used uh, by the data source bundle, but also uh, by the different domain bundles. And this way, changes done in each of those persistence contexts will be synced to the transaction, and at the end, they will be committed as a whole uh, into the data source. Um, so this actually allows us to uh, support uh, cross-domain use cases in which uh, the distributed ETA transactions are at this moment uh, the, uh, the way we could solve that. And for the final uh, challenge, I give the word to Stan again. So thanks, Tom. So um, Tom has shown us how to actually modularize our com complex domain into well-crafted 
uh, modules. And of course, we want to actually maintain those module boundaries uh, throughout the evolution of our system. And of course, here comes the tale of the evil joints. There will be use cases where, of course, for search reasons, you have to actually join different or join different modules or join across different modules, join tables across different modules. And of course, if we're then uh, doing the obvious thing and just joining it again on the database level, then we're violating our well-crafted module boundaries again. Uh, let's, what will happen, for example, if some of the module owners, uh, can be a completely different team, decides to actually use a different database technology or update the database or go to a NoSQL, from a SQL to a NoSQL approach because they deem it necessary. Of course, when we're hardwiring everything together by doing joins again on the database level, we're um, ending up with this big ball of nut again that we are doing our total best to actually um, avoid. So what would be the obvious solution? Of course, say no to cross-module searches. Um, but we seldom have a business owner that cares that much about modularization to actually um, accept this argument. But to be honest, what we did in our uh, platform approach is actually we tried to avoid cross-module searches as long as possible. And there is a good thing about avoiding or trying to avoid cross-module searches is that at least your boundaries will become more solid. You start thinking about, do we really need the use cases or do we need, really need this data from the audio, other module or can we stick to, uh, uh, to, to, to um, um, encapsulating the functionality in a single module? And that's a, that's a good thing and that's also the right approach. Of course, saying no is of course not the, uh, the solution. So um, what is then the, the solution? Well, as this diagram uh, tries to depict is of course accessing the underlying database structure of the modules is not the solution, right? So what we actually are doing is we're creating a new search module that will um, encapsulate the uh, interrogation queries to the different modules. So what we are actually doing is, of course, we are using the API of the domain module. For example, in the DDD context, the domain mo module will probably expose a repository to the outside world. And what the responsibility of the search module is, is actually use the repository the module uh, exposes to create uh, a cross-module uh, um, search. Of course, this will need to be implemented and depends heavily on the repository, the API, and also the query at hand. And so, for example, uh, let's say that I'm trying to uh, query all BMWs that are currently today on a transport, then probably I will be first looking at my vehicle domain for all BMWs. I get identifiers back, and with those identifiers, I'm querying the transport module for all transport with those vehicle identifiers on. It doesn't really sound that efficient, uh, because I'm not leveraging any of the possibilities that my underlying storage mechanism, of course, uh, offers me. Yeah? For example, this would typically uh, result in um, in a join across different tables with index optimization in place, well, this it cannot be leveraged. Even more so, the, how I'm implementing this uh, search, this cross-module search, will depend heavily on my actually query uh, uh, that I have to implement. It might be so that for a different query, I need to implement a totally, totally different part through my different modules. So, of course, this is not a maintainable uh, solution in the long run. Again, because I'm not leveraging any of the underlying database optimization techniques that my database offers, and I'm also creating uh, something that's very, very specific and probably hard to maintain, and thus, with uh, changes to my query requirements, will have also an impact on my code base. So, 
what you actually want to do is make sure you, you can respond to searches based on a different module, a model, so that you don't need uh, the actual uh, internals of the domain, but you can actually query a different module, a uh, different model, I must say, sorry again, a different model to, uh, to respond to your, your queries, right? And this is not, not, not new, right? It's uh, part of the uh, CQRS uh, pattern, so command query responsibility segregation pattern. And it's a, it's a, well, it's a, best, a bad, best practice, actually. Um, the good thing about CQRS is, of course, you're dividing your update stream from your query stream. And we see in most applications that queries have different requirements than updates. And probably your application or your use case is either update intensive or query intensive. So you use actually a technology that is tailored and optimized for your specific use case. So now we have a, a, a model that we can actually uh, use to respond to our searches. And the uh, challenge now uh, becomes, of course, how are we creating this model? And how are we actually uh, making sure that this model remains up to date because, of course, I will have update commands coming in on my different uh, domain objects, entities, for example, and the changes need to be reflected in my search specific model so that I'm, of course, returning the right data to my end user. So that is actually the challenge that we need to overcome. Of course, the first thing that we had to decide upon is how are we going to implement this uh, search uh, a module. What technology will be the basis of our uh, solution? And uh, for us, uh, and I'm not going to pitch that solution, it was Elasticsearch, and it still is Elasticsearch, and I can only say that we are very happy with, with that choice. So I think we will just make the same cho uh, uh, choice again uh, today. And it has some characteristics that really helped us to implement um, uh, CQRS for us in an efficient way. Um, just a sh quick show of hands. Who's using Elasticsearch? That's uh, not that many. Who's familiar with Elasticsearch? Uh, more, more people. Um, so I'll just give a very, very short overview of, of, of uh, Elasticsearch because it, it will just serve my, my uh, elaboration later on. So important to know is that Elasticsearch is, in essence, schemaless. So you can just send whatever document to it, to an index, and it will start indexing this particular document. So from an Elasticsearch, there is a, important to know that you have an index. In this example, it's the vehicle index. And we're storing documents in this index of a particular type. And that's the, in this case, it's the external document type I'm referring to. So one could say that in a database world, an index would be a database and a document type would be a table. Uh, every item in the index uh, of a particular type has an identifier, in this case one. It can be auto-generated when actually uh, uploading a document to the index. And in my example, I'm just putting, because it's a REST API, uh, that is exposed by Elasticsearch. I'm putting a vehicle in here of uh, make BMW with a particular VIN number. Of course, there is some uh, nifty mapping uh, logic going on because, of course, all things, all properties will be uh, indexed appropriately. And there is, of course, some mapping meta metadata that I need to provide uh, specifically for the type, if I need the non-default behavior for querying the index later on, of course. I can, of course, also update the index because that will be needed. Eh? We are going to uh, change the entity, so I'll be a I need to be able to update the index. And that's done using a post, of course, as a good REST citizen. Uh, in this case, making not it, it, it's the vehicle not an ordinary BMW, but a real Alpina. For the BMW fans, it makes a difference. Um, of course, I can then query this index again, and I'm now querying the index um, vehicle 
with a particular query that I need to uh, uh, that the document uh, needs documents needs to match, and this is a query for all vehicles that are of make BMW, and I get some JSON results back, uh, giving me some metadata with uh, regard to this search query. For example, how long it took, the number of charts that I have in my system currently available, and these are just the defaults, being five. And I get some results back uh, with uh, a matching score uh, based on, of course, the matching that uh, Elasticsearch is doing uh, uh, on, on the data in the index, taking into account, of course, my mapping metadata that I provided. So this is actually a very short primer of Elasticsearch. It, it, it adds, uh, besides being a, f a very uh, interesting functional uh, solution, also some technical interesting uh, 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 capabilities. It is uh, fully distributed, so it supports uh, both charting and replication. So charting can add uh, quite some um, interesting uh, query performance optimization. And replication, of course, might add some durability to your indexing. It supports advanced querying because underneath it's all leveraging the good old Lucene. So, for example, geo-based queries, everything becomes uh, a lot easier than, than uh, when, when having to leverage your good old relational database for queries. It also supports aggregation. So you can actually aggregate based on terms, on ranges, on, on timings. And from a Java perspective, it's also very nice to know that there is a, a good Java API and also a Java testing API if you are running or creating Elasticsearch-specific uh, code. So that actually was part of our, uh, evalua were part of our evaluation criteria when, when opting for Elasticsearch. So with that out of the way, we knew what technology we we're going to use. So uh, the first thing that we actually need to do is populate the index. So uh, my entities are being mutated because I get commands in. Uh, and of course, this mutation will need to result in updates, uh, creation or updates or deletion of uh, uh, items in my index. We are. Uh, for most parts, we are leveraging, and I must say for most parts, we're leveraging JPA. We're using Eclipse Link internally. And um, JPA has this nice um, entity listener concept that we can actually hook into so that we can get callbacks when a particular entity is created, deleted, or updated. And of course, this can be leveraged to uh, send out events so that we can then trap to update our, uh, our index. So we have a generic module that exposes uh, this very simple interface, the search index service interface. And of course, we need to uh, tie in all the uh, updates coming in and making sure that we call the, the right uh, operations on the search index service in our example. So if there is, for example, uh, a an update going on, we're going to call the update on the search index service with the entity as a parameter. That's how we're actually linking them together. And this linking is completely done uh, transparently because there is a generic entity listener registered in my particular uh, module uh, in the persistent uh, unit of that particular module, I must say. So um, what this... Um, search index server actually is doing, it's tracking all the updates to entities. So that's its primer, primer, primary responsibility. So whatever things change in my domain actually will be tracked by my search index service. And of course, it also needs to map down this data, a second uh, responsibility. It needs to map this data to the search-specific data model. So there is some mapping going on from my entity model to my search-specific data model. And this data model can be quite different, right? Because in, as a good DDD citizen, I'm having some aggregate routes in my, in my, uh, in my module that uh, encapsulate uh, a lot of functionality, but also, also, also a lot of data. 
and I'm mapping this to a search-specific data model, right? So this, there is, there is a, a, quite a delta, or there is a delta possible between those two data models. So for that, there is a, um, a concept in our, um, in our uh, system in place that we call a search data provider. So it provides data to the search index, and it is responsible for doing the mapping. It's nothing more, nothing less than that. As you can see, what it can do, it can map from entity to search data, and it can be a one-to-many mapping, so a single entity can result in much search data, and it can map a particular entity class. So it can map, it's a mapper for a particular class. Now, the most important thing is, and uh, that's also the reason why I'm mentioning is this, is that the search data provider is actually encapsulated in the domain modu uh, module itself, so that the internals of the entity structure don't leak to the outside world. And the obvious solution would be, of course, that uh, an external thing, the search data provider, uh, the, the search index service, for example, would be querying my internal domain. And that's, of course, something I don't want because then I'm exposing a lot of information of my internal domain to an external party that just needs it for creating its own data model, eh? violating some very important uh, DDD uh, concepts here. So the important thing is that the search data provider resides in the module where the entity resides. So, what happens is that every domain module exposes a search data provider. So that when this mapping needs to be uh, done, that uh, the search index server can look for search data providers that provide a mapping for the particular type that the search index provider needs to build his index for. Right? So that's what's going to happen. So there is a, a matching going on saying, OK, I need to uh, create uh, or update uh, a document uh, for this particular class. Well, I need to search for a search data provider that will map this class in entity information to a document. Right? So that's the responsibility of my search data provider. And last but not least, when I then have all the search data in place, I'm going to do a bulk index update. So everything will be done in bulk. And that's because, of course, it's a lot more efficient to do it in bulk. And secondly, because we want to synchronize all this on the transaction. So that if multiple updates are going on across different uh, modules, that, of course, only when the transaction is committed as a whole, my uh, search index is uh, updated. So it will be eventually consistent, but at least it will be consistent and not inconsistent when not taking into account the transaction boundary. So transaction synchronization here is, of course, an important thing. If the update cannot go through, it's not a problem at all, it will be eventually consistent, but at least we want it to synchronize on the transaction. The second thing that, of course, um, um, a search uh, solution needs to do is, of course, support search, right? Support querying. And for us, our use case is not that, uh, let's say, specific. Nevertheless, we have some you know, requirements that are typically harder to do when not leveraging a solution such as Elasticsearch. And this is, for example, one of the the screens, the main screen in the, in the automotive service platform application where you can see all the cars of a particular dealer. And it's a pass platform, so we have different dealers that own data. And they, don't, they only want, of course, the cars listed there in the drop-down box that they actually own currently. So if, if it's a BMW dealer, uh, I, they don't care about Alfa Romeos, right? So we don't want to provide that as a, as a, as a, a potential map, a match uh, in your uh, search bar there. So they want actually the search bar to be quite uh, uh, dynamic and, uh, and based on the actual data that's in my index. Classically, that's something a bit harder to do when, when just creating your own search uh, solution. The second thing is they want the... Um, 
the search to be very dynamic. So they want to be able to actually to, to, uh, to configure the search screen so that they can add different criteria to the searches based on the capabilities of the platform. And the capabilities of the platform are based on the runtime capabilities, but also on the subscriptions that the, pass, that the, pro, uh, that, that, that the user has on a set of pass services. So there is some dynamic behavior going on here. And then the question is, how are we doing this? Well, in essence, it's, it's very simple. The search service offers this API, and it's not more than that. There is, of course, a possibility to query uh, for, uh, for documents that match a particular set of criteria. And there, is, there are some um, operations to actually uh, create this search bar. So, for example, I can ask the search service for the available search criteria. It will give me a list of all the search criteria that I have available in the system. It will be used to populate the drop-down that you saw at the uh, right corner of the previous screen. And of course, for every one of those uh, criteria, I also want to provide hints to what values that are possible. So my, my makes, for example. And that's the options method that is actually provided there. So how is this done? Well, more or less on the same pattern with, as with the, uh, the previous uh, providing the index data, every uh, module will expose a search data provider. And a search data provider will give me information on the search criteria that it actually offers. Of course, it's tied to the the document that will be indexed, right? Because I'm using the index in the end to search uh, uh, for data. So the get available criteria will give me a list of si uh, search criterions, and every search criterion gives me a hint on what it is, of course, searching on. So in this example, vehicle uh, mileage, the uh, unit, uh, the, the, how it, it, whether it's a number and whether it can be searched as a range, for example, eh, to say oh, I'm, I'm uh, looking for vehicles within a particular uh, mileage range, and of course some data on the service item, so that's the document that I'm searching for. And this will then be exposed by the module as a search criteria provider, and my search index service will look dynamically in the system for search criteria providers and will uh, populate the screen. We're doing modularization end-to-end, -end, so from the Angular front-end part to the database, and making sure that my Angular screen is dynamically populated based on the search criteria providers that I have available for that particular user in my system. And that's then tied together to make sure that the user can search uh, um, based on the capabilities of the platform, or his platform, I must say. So this more or less wraps up my part on search. Um, given that, we of course had a number of uh, lessons learned. Um, regarding the migration part, one thing is we're actually migrating at deployment time, so that can be quite a risk. So what we've deemed as uh, necessary is to have a continuous integration build that will each night migrate a new dump of production data so that we know uh, upfront when that will fail uh, uh, due to uh, a, late ch uh, a change that was made. Also, getting the modernization, uh, even functional modernization, right from the first time is not uh, that easy. So sometimes you have a new insight which makes that you have to restructure that. Uh, that can also imply that you have some uh, unwanted migration dependencies between your modules. And from time to time, it's a good idea to uh, actually do some maintenance on those uh, database change sets that are defined so that each module is again focused on its own uh, schema. And from a cross domain search and reporting. All the bezoekers from JFL are uitgenodigd for the lunch. Eat smakelijk. You still have 54 seconds, so. So we saw that, the, that actually coming up with a cross-domain search um, feature is actually a challenge. But if, once you actually have a solution in place, creating very complex queries becomes, or, or, or search capabilities actually becomes very easy to do. 
Um, and of course, because we're leveraging Elasticsearch, you have very advanced things at your disposal uh, to please your, your business stakeholder. We'll, we'll probably best skip this slide. It's uh, uh, listing what are possible next step and, and things that uh, we're, we're still looking into. But the important thing is, is our conclusion. So by leveraging and making Liquibase a first-class citizen of OSGI as an extender, we're able to uh, do modular migration at deployment time and migrate each of those uh, domains separately. Cross-domain use cases for transaction support have to reside to distributed TTA transactions. And uh, the cross-domain search uh, capabilities, which are based on Elasticsearch, allows us to, to uh, tackle those uh, cases. Using that, we actually had uh, the possibility to uh, cope with two important customer requirements. One, functionally, that he doesn't want the software to be limited by the module boundaries, and we can still support uh, those cross-domain uh, cases. And non-functionally, that we still have a future-proof platform in which we have loose coupling and high cohesion, and that the impact of a change is contained within one of those modules to end up with a predictable cost of change, which our customers and we also want to have. So that was uh, our presentation. There's, according to that time, no time anymore for questions, but uh, if there are still some... We'll stick we around, so feel come to the stage if you, want, you still have questions. So, uh, so thanks, thanks for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>